long day, I got a lot to say. It feels like I'm carrying a two-ton weight. I go to see a friend. Hello, I'm Monsignor Patrick Winslow. And I am Father Matthew Kauth. And we are speaking from the rooftop. A podcast brought to you by Tan Books, in which we invite you to join our conversation out here in the open air. Where we look out upon the world around us from the rooftop of the church and share with you what we see. It makes me wanna scream. Well, hello there. Well, hello. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Excellent. Doing quite well. Oh, well, I'm glad to see that. So, hmm. you obviously have nothing to talk about. <laughs> no, no. I thought you I'll were, start. I'll I start. thought your sentence was incomplete <laughs> and you're trying to get your mind to work, which is like starting one of those old Ford cars, you know, when you, you have to go outside and crank it up. Yeah. I thought, that's what he's doing. He's, 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 he's trying to see a, a little smoke and sputtering no, coming out of the ears. I thought it'd be fun to have a little moment of awkward silence. What happens when the the, the unique circumstance when neither you or, not, or I have something to say? Oh, I, we have plenty. Of yeah, it's about it's about two to three seconds. <laughs> All right, so let's kind of jump into a, a deeper, a deeper, or at least deeper thought for me. It's a uh, reflecting on the glorious mysteries. Okay. Okay. So sometime during Holy Week, I think, or leading up to Holy Week, I was reading, I believe it was Ratzinger, and, uh, but it may have been another uh, theologian along the, along the same lines, where he was uh, speaking about the impact of the Paschal mystery in our lives. And and the bringing about of the kingdom of God. And that at the time of our Lord and all leading and, and all history leading up to it with, with respect to the Jews and the anticipation of a Messiah, that there was a sense of the kingdom being in line with history, that there was the history of the of, of the Jewish people, the promises made through Abraham, and then subsequently the the other covenants and David, then arriving to the time of Christ, an expectation was that this kingdom would be inaugurated within time, within history, and it was going to be sequential, right? So you you move through the past and you arrive to the kingdom in history. And he was making the point how totally unprepared the faithful of that time were to deal with God's plan of revealing a kingdom that was not going to be realized as a period of history, but rather a kingdom that was going to, uh, to in a certain sense, um, be realized above history. Uh, in in eternity, and it would be experienced by the faithful in history, mm-hmm. but not be a chapter of history. Mm-hmm. You follow me? I do. It has a historical point, but it transcends that historical point, and then also has an eternal character. Exactly, and it, that, that that is eternal. And it's toward which, just so you know, the, the Great Danes are at it again. Uh, so Lupo's snoring. Well, he's being put to sleep by you, but <laughs> <laughs> probably so he's not actually, up. That was me he, He's not up for this. <laughs> okay, so I haven't even got to the rosary yet. Uh, but just, just we're almost out of time. We're, 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 we're almost. Are we? Are we at the end of our time? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So this whole idea that we're not talking about the Messiah coming and inaugurating a kingdom. Um, that would be a chapter, sort of a concluding chapter of history. But rather what, we're, what is being revealed to us in and through Christ is the, the ultimate eternal chapter of the kingdom of God that breaks in through his passion, death, and resurrection and becomes accessible to every moment of history thereafter 
Meanwhile, history marches and on. In some sense, before. And in some sense, before, yeah. precisely. Because we're dealing with the Abraham eternal rejoice to see my day. Exactly. Exactly. So there is that that sense of turning their eyes to the kingdom in a different direction, um, above them, but yet imminently present, right? We talk about uh, the, esch- the, the eschatological tension, and we talk about uh, the, the delay of the parousia and oh, all these Now terms. it's me who needs to translate Father Winslow. <laughs> eschatological tension. I'm sure that those are household words that you guys banter about at the, at the dinner table. Well, <laughs> the eschaton just means the end, the end things, the, uh-huh. the tension between the time that is now and the fulfillment of time. Um, and then the parousia is another fancy term. It is a fancy term. term. Um, which means the the coming of Christ, the second coming, his return. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yes, uh, but the kingdom is is now, but not fully present. Right now, but not yet. Right, right. In that sense, that even though time marches on and we're in time, the kingdom is present in time. Insofar as the kingdom is realized uh, within the lives of the faithful. Um, you know, here and now, and is fully realized ultimately in eternity. Um, so, praying and reflecting upon—you can correct anything that you might need to be corrected there. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm making a list. <laughs> I know it's it's so hard to speak very plainly uh, without getting into jargon. Yeah, I know. But um, the all right. So let me kind of get back to my thought. So, reflecting upon the mysteries of the Holy Rosary, in particular. I was reflecting upon the resurrection and the ascension of our Lord. Uh, then, subsequently, the descent of the Holy Spirit. There is that our Lord rises and takes his place at the right hand of the Father and ascends. So, the first two glorious mysteries. And then the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And then I'm seeing a current, right? I'm seeing mm-hmm. um, the Messiah leading to the fullness of the kingdom um, and taking his place at the right hand of the Father and then sending the spirit down upon the church and it's creating this this uh this this exchange this uh access to the fullness of the kingdom here and now in and through um the ascension of our lord and the descent of the holy spirit and then reflecting upon the blessed virgin mary and her assumption into heaven that she's caught up into that current and following her son body and soul into the fullness of the kingdom and there as she is receiving her crown as the queen mother of our Lord, that that crown, by inference anyway, seems to be a a return back to the faithful uh, here below, if you will, in much the same way that you might see uh, in the descent of the Holy Spirit. I, I mean that analogously, where, of course, there's some similarity, but obviously a lot of dissimilarity. But the similarity being that her crown, her her um, queenship, is used to do good for the faithful. Mm. That there is that sense of she follows her Lord to the fullness of the kingdom. That kingdom is made accessible in profound and unique ways by the descent of the Holy Spirit. The whole sacrament, you know, the, the sacraments are affected in through that fall into the the, the Holy Spirit. Um, then you have the Blessed Virgin Mary following upward, but then by virtue of her queenship, imparting as an instrument of grace uh, her her benevolence and her motherly care and attention to us below. In in, in a similar way. All right, go ahead, pick apart. The the necessary theological distinctions that we need to. No, no, I, I I think that the first thing I would say is you know that we have that passage in the third chapter of John when Christ tells Nicodemus that we have to be be born from above, right? Mm-hmm. Out of them. and it's one of those fun Greek words with to mean one to highlight the fact that Nicodemus is thinking earthly thoughts and our Lord is not, and that gets to that notion of. When we build a church, for example, or when we, we think about heaven, we think about, about it being up. And this is a Retzinger point in one of his mm-hmm. books that says, well, it, how else do you depict it? Because it, we're spatial creatures. And so mm-hmm. you think about up 
And so you, you have to have something higher than you. But that, the fact that it's higher or that we worship on mountains or we think about mm -hmm. clouds and rainbows and, and things that in the sun and the heavens, et cetera. Um, so much so that the word in most languages for the heavens is this, is the same, right? It's just the sky. Right. Um, that what is depicted in us spatially and what we feel bodily is, is in some sense a metaphor for a higher kind of realm, a higher kind of life, a higher kind of kingdom that has its its foothold here in this world, not just in souls, but in, in a collective matter relative to the church, right? The church is, is that kingdom so much so that when Christ des describes the kingdom, oftentimes in Matthew's gospel, he's talking about it clearly as something here. Is at the end mm -hmm. of when the when the kingdom comes to its its fulfillment, then we will separate the, right. the these fish from those fish, the sheep from the goats. The this right now, we're talking about the second coming, and yeah. so we've got mm -hmm. this place that the kingdom is here. It's got its it's got its foothold here, um, but it doesn't reign the same way as Christ said to Pilate. Right, my kingdom is none of this world, and yet in and through the church, as you say. Um, you have this incredible reign. And as I think rightly so, if Christ, is, I think, if I understand what you're saying, if Christ gains the victory, he says he's going to send us his spirit. He tells Mary Magdalene, you cannot cling to me in this fashion. I've not yet ascended to my father. It's better for you if I go, because if I go, I will send you the spirit. So somehow his removal from our our senses allows us to participate. And I think we talked about last time in his divine life, in his life, in a, his real life that we can have inside of us, which makes us members of his household, members of his kingdom. But we're still here. Mm -hmm. And, and then, we are still participating in that kingdom. In that kingdom. And so when you go to a church, for example, the reason they're supposed to look like that kingdom is mm -hmm. because that's what you're doing there. Mm -hmm. You're participating in something that's celestial. And so with her assumption and crowning absolutely i think that makes perfect sense relative to she who is the spouse of the holy spirit because all of her queenly activity regards the church that's here right i mean who else is she ruling right and and, and what it's, she's it's not true. ruling for for what other end to what other than end? our own benefit yeah yeah and it just it just that sense of current upward and then returning yeah and that that our lady would would follow in the same pattern and just to consider so many graces that she in the divine plan um, is permitted to intercede on behalf of others and distribute. It's just a, an extraordinary thing. But it gave me a new appreciation for the coronation, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the mm. queenship. Because so often it's it's easy to kind of reflect on that mystery and think, oh, well, she's taking her rightful place in the kingdom yeah. of heaven. She got her prize. Right. Yeah. And that, that's a sign for us that we're going to get ours as well, yeah. you know, in the sense that we follow in that pattern. But it's not. I mean, nothing of her seems to be uh, self-referential. Well, I mean, that's that's clearly the case. You I know, mean, nothing about her is self-referential. That's one of the things I, I just marvel at with the Annunciation and the Visitation Mysteries, just to expand this a little mm -hmm. bit, is that... Our Lady can say things that would be absolutely audacious for anyone else to say, but mm -hmm. she can only say it because she's she can refer to herself as his work, mm -hmm. not as something that she has accomplished. And that's perfectly true. Mm -hmm. And yet she can rejoice in it and even give praise to him for it. So you can she can say something like, you know, you, imagine if you walked in the room and you said, Eche. Right. <laughs> it's a hold. Exactly. <laughs> I think I think we'd get a chuckle out of yeah, that. Of course. One. Um but she can say to the angel, Behold. Yeah. Um, look at me. I, I am the handmaid of the Lord. I just am. That's what he has made me to be. And then furthermore in the Magnificat, it's it's almost as if she's standing next to Elizabeth, shoulder to shoulder, looking at herself over across the way. Like it's amazing. Look at that. My, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, because he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. And from this day, all generations will call me blessed. What a thing to say. Right. But everything because of what he's done. So you say it's not self-referential, and nor are her, nor is her crowning something. Self-adulation. And yet we. <laughs> a prize that she's 
that she's happy, you know, that she's walking around and in this adornment, and she's pleased with just the adornment. adornment. Right, right. And yet, at the same time, this reciprocal action takes place because, you know, I I I, I work at a seminary, right? So, one of the things that that I notice with the men as they discern their vocation, and I think it's kind of a, a hallmark of any vocation, is the moment they develop a real tender and filial devotion for Our Lady. Like, mm. You really don't... I, I've never seen a vocation without it, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. I've seen guys struggle in the beginning with that kind of thing, but at some point it just sort of clicks in. And it's that sort of chivalrous thing that's so deep in the heart of men that that I want to have a woman that I can offer my life for and to serve. And it takes it out of the realm, right, of, of just the married state. Not that that's not glorious, but it's it's it, it's done in such a particular way and it comes with all the particular difficulties that that has. Mm-hmm. And so that old idea of a knight um, who maintains his chastity and gives himself over to the service of a queen, and all that stuff is still deeply embedded mm-hmm. into the piety of the church. When a young man says, I'm going to take all of my powers, summon them up in a virtue of chastity, and offer them for the service of the church. And that takes deep expression in the desire to crown Our Lady. Mm-hmm. It takes deep expression in the desire to, to, to do something for her. I remember when <laughs> we were at seminary, um, we had that that beautiful statue that you and I both love, the yeah. Sapiencia. And, and there was a, a seminarian uh, who we didn't, how shall I say this? We didn't really get along too well. Mm. Uh, you and I did not care for this individual too much. So we, There's so many. I can't remember which big, one. <laughs> it was a bit of a conflict. Um, yeah, I can imagine. And it was such an ideological time. And it was fractured. Else. There were so many parts. And fractures. we're all immature and blah, blah, blah. Mm. But the, the point was is that um, we didn't ever see any piety in this guy or any prayerfulness yeah. or anything else. And then we're walking outside one day and you and I and a couple of our friends, we saw him putting a crown of flowers mm-hmm. on Our Lady's statue. Yes. And I remember one of us said, uh, well, that's about all it's going to take probably for him to get into heaven. <laughs> 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 because we could all recognize that if he's doing something, like yeah. there's some kind of seed in him. And so the reason I bring it up is because there is this sort of, like she uses her queenship to serve her children as, as a mother does. That's why Therese says she's more mother than queen. Right. Um, and yet we use her service um, to bring her back flowers or something, to bring her back something by right. which we can say, I want to make you beautiful too. I want to clothe you in this beautiful, as just as our Lord did. Um, and, and, you know, and, and that's where I come, my mind went in this decade of the rosary. That's and, a pretty good decade of the rosary. Oh, well, thanks. <laughs> um, which was uh, thinking about the gems of a crown and you know what they truly are, uh, not necessarily a gemstone, but rather uh, uh, the reflection of the particular graces for which she has been instrumental. Mm. So that what's truly brilliant and what's truly shining with 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 glory and color are are the aid and assistance that she's offered to hear we who are here below. Um, to think of the times in my life or to think of the times in other people's lives that I'm aware of where the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary has been so critical mm. and so profound. Yes. And to think that they're they're a part of her crown. Yeah. That they're oh that, yeah, they're, absolutely. they're a gem there. And that those are the things that are that are sparkling. Those are the things that make it a crown like no other. Um you know, you see it in all mm-hmm. of its beauty, but to understand truly at its um at, 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 at truly at its core at its very center yeah that these are these are actually she doesn't grace. care about diamonds yeah but, but yeah, they sparkle more but, than but them. that's her gem you know a, a soul that she they're more beautiful than them yeah, they, one of her children that's a that's a delightful image of course we we do speak about our lady as the queen of the angels and and I, I love that the Easter Vigil, we have that, that reading from Baruch. Like, I don't read Baruch right. like, all year long. I, I never think Except that. Except maybe at a wedding, right? I rarely, yeah, I, but I just rarely think to open up the scriptures and yeah, read Yeah, no Baruch. one thing, no. Mm-hmm. Um, Not a go-to. And word. I love it. 
I, yeah. I, I, I kind of, it's just like Lily, I, I wait until the, that moment, <laughs> Easter to hear it again. It's because seasonal. I love the way it describes the stars as they are sent out. Mm. And, and then he calls to them and they come back to him um, with joy, trembling with joy, it says. The stars come, almost like persons, right? They, he sends them out and they come back and they're trembling with joy and they say, uh, ad sumus, right? We are here. And shining before his face. And the, when I first read that, I thought, what an interesting way to, to depict the stars. And I didn't realize at the time, this is when I was living in Italy, and so I, I heard this thing in Italian for the first time that it really, it really struck me. Um, and of course, they say, eccoci. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> When they come back before the Lord, um, and didn't just didn't realize at the time how much uh, allegorically, metaphorically, the stars were considered, of course, the the angels, God's army. So they're always depicted as the stars in the sky, or those those images of the angels in God's God's grand um, heavenly host. Um, and so when we talk about her as being the queen of the angels. Um, oftentimes you, you think about the stars around her, around her head as mm -hmm. 12 stars, as 12 depicted apostles, in art. but mm -hmm. it's also, it's also the angels, right? They're, they're her children too, right. in some ways. So I wonder how that works because on some level she had, she has no labor, you know, angels mm. are in heaven, right. right? They, they behold the face of God and yet they delight to serve her. I wonder what that is like. In other words, how does that queenship um, work. go back and forth with yeah. the angels? I mean, clearly we do have the image of, of Gabriel, and she is not, she's kind of in charge of the scene. Mm -hmm. So even as a, as a girl, seeing an angel for the first time, she has this incredible command um, and sort of a queenly bearing to her in that mm -hmm. scene. And I just sort of wonder my own prayer life and how much the angels must delight Right. I mean, can you imagine if an angel appears to you even before the angel speaks? I mean, what sort of dumbfounded reaction we yeah. would have. Meanwhile, she just stands there and <laughs> receives the message. Wondering what this greeting might mean. Yeah. <laughs> As if it's the most normal Why thing would, in the world. Right. <laughs> right. Can you imagine? Yeah. And yet there is not an ounce of pride in it. Yeah. Uh, just a, a, a complete confidence in the Lord her God. So truly, truly, truly extraordinary. And so, and it, you know, kind of circling back, we could just reflect a little bit on how we do reflect upon the mysteries of the rosary. You know, I think that, you know, here I am, you know, very inartfully throwing in your direction just these thoughts that I can see congeal together in a certain trend line, like a certain symmetry of of our Lord mm. uh, resurrecting, ascending, and sending the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary, obviously assuming, but in her taking her place in heaven, that doesn't end that there is a type of sending back by virtue of her acts of grace uh, that, that constitute the crown. And so following and so in that descent of the Holy Spirit, there is her interaction with us here below. But, you know, it, reflecting on the mysteries of the rosary, sometimes... People might just think, well, I have to only imagine the scene as it took place. So you're thinking mm. about the resurrection. You're thinking about the, the women went to the tomb. You're mm. thinking about the tomb rolling back. You're thinking about the angel. Yeah, and then you find yourself rather having exhausted your your, your If you're the rosary every day. Of yeah. <laughs> cache of images, right? And so the idea of going further and deeper into those images and starting to bring in some theological reflection, starting to bring in some personal inquiry, uh, personal piety and affection, but also uh, curiosity, and taking that time and using that that little decade, uh, which goes by so quickly, mm. um, is a moment to explore uh, in 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 the reflection, but not just something of having to play a movie in your mind. Uh, where yeah. it just it gets on a rote loop. Um, yeah. I, I, I defer to you to, to comment because I think I've actually provided a, 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 unwittingly a demonstration of the convolution that is my mind <laughs> when I pray the mystery of the rosary. So um, 
when you pray the mysteries of the rosary, I, you're doing the same, are you not? I do. I I, I typically take. Um, it depends on it t- depends on where I am and what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Frankly, if I'm not in a position where I have been praying and I'm, for example, I'm I'm present before the Blessed Sacrament or something that I can actually engage my mind in a better way, then I typically turn the rosary into my moments for intercession. And so I will take the different mysteries. I'm not always terribly good at intercession. Like, I love meditation. I love Lectio Divina. I love thinking Mm -hmm. and talking to God. I just love it. Mm -hmm. Um, What I don't like doing is thinking about other people during prayer. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's it's like, I'm not very good at petitionary prayer. And yet it's one of the greatest things we can do for someone in in acts of charity. And so I, I, I sort of push myself, I have pushed myself as of the last however much time to be more responsible in that vein. Because sometimes you think that you can sort of knock it out by the virtue of the fact that you say the divine office because what priests do for the faithful. Like we say the office, we, we pray seven times a day for the faithful. Um, it's fairly short, some of it. and But that's kind of our opus day. It's our work of God for the people and we intercede for you. And But I, I, I like to do it with the rosary too, which for me brings up sort of, I can't quite get away even an intercession from my mind spinning off. If, if I'm in a particular mystery and I'm offering for a particular person or group of persons, it is interesting how the mystery gets looked at differently because of the persons mm-hmm. for whom I'm praying. As and, scripture does at any time in your life, when things change in your life, then you begin to see new things. The light is different. The light is different. And, you know, I, I do the same with distraction. I mean, we all know what it's like to be distracted. Yeah. Uh, we have things on our mind, things that uh, are weighing on us. Or things that are just new and exciting, but they're in our heads and we can't get out of them. Sometimes it's as simple as, you know, I'm thinking about what I'm going to cook that evening. Sure. And for for whatever reason, it is locked in the floor of my head. And setting it aside <laughs> is a hard thing to do when I have to pray a rosary. Well, not have to, but I want to pray a rosary. Sure, sure, sure. So um, what I'll do is if I find that these thoughts keep surfacing, then I'll beg the question... In what way can I incorporate that mm-hmm. thing into the the inspection of this mystery? So uh, let's say it's something as silly as, you know, uh, how I'm going to alter my, my Italian meatballs for the evening um, in, in my <laughs> recipe. I might think, well, okay, um, you know, you know, pick a mystery, the, uh, the visitation. I might think, okay, well, Elizabeth would have received Our Lady. They would have had something to eat. Exactly. What would that have been like? Yeah. What would they have talked about? You know, just kind of instead of fighting the wave of distraction ride the wave ride the wave of distraction and gear it toward the direction of your meditation yeah and i find that to be helpful and useful and you see things in different light and it allows you to explore different things that's true i was doing that recently with um thinking about the resurrection obviously this is the theme in the easter season and and trying to keep coming back to that so Typically, during Advent, I only pray the joyful mysteries of the rosary. I don't do the different mysteries every right. every day um, during the seasons. Lent, I only do the sorrowful. Easter, I only do the glorious. Hmm, interesting. And my purpose in doing that is I just trying to drill down into the ones that were that, in whose season we are. And so, I typically will think about the resurrection. I have to say, almost like for all five mysteries. I'll mention, in, you know, the other ones. I'll mention them, but I, I kind of keep going back. Right. And so. What Sometimes are, I feel like a short shrifted one. I know, exactly. Because right, it kind of spills into the next one. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Um, <laughs> so I'm just, I was just thinking about the rosary recently. We, were, we pray the rosary at common yeah. in the seminary at, off, on some days. And uh, one of the guys in the seminary, he like always adds two or three Hail Marys, the decades. He's not keeping track? or well, is he just? He, I think he quiet? always thinks he get, he went too fast or oh. he, he shortchanged something. And so he always adds one. Now we're up to adding two or three. Oh, no. So it's funny because you can feel the room. I throw a flag in the chapel. You feel the room. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. We're done with that decade. We're moving right. on. <laughs> and it's not because they're against praying. Don't virtue signal but here. <laughs> you know, do not make this about you. Flag on the field. But I went back to the re- resurrection. I Again, talking about not just replaying the scene, but a lot of other things being incorporated into that. And I was thinking about our Lord's eating with the, since you mentioned eating, yeah. eating with the apostles. And then my mind went back to Lazarus 
and thought to myself, what a strange thing. I mean, you just raised him from the dead, but you didn't raise him to a glorified life. Mm. You raised him to his natural life again. Right. And so after they take the bandages off and mm-hmm. the stench is gone, he takes a bath. I mean, life goes on. Right. Like at some point you got to go back and just have a meal because you've got a real body right. and that body has to be nourished. So here we are at table and despite the fact that we have this incredible scene of the anointing of our Lord and Judas with the money bag and the whole thing, what is all the stuff around that? I mean, if you came back from the dead with a natural life, you just have to go back to living the life you lived before, which is not what we're looking for. Right. Like if anyone that died that you're friends with, that you care about, if they came back, on some level, yes, we'd be after the shock and amazement of the whole thing, we would take up our lives again. Yeah. And you would be just as mean to me then as you are to me now, once the shock was I over. Would. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you just get back into life, right? I'd be more justified. Yeah, well, I, I, might, have, I might have seen some things that might make me better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so before going, I got a little exercise then. You, we, maybe we can do this back and forth. Mm. All right. I'm going to give you a mystery of the rosary and a distracting thought. And I want you to very quickly <laughs> tell me how you would how you would turn it in the direction of the meditation of that mystery. All right. Okay. So um, let's take, uh, well, we've already done a lot of the glorious. So we'll go to the, we'll take um, the presentation of Jesus in the temple. Mm-hmm. Laundry. Laundry. You have to do your laundry later. Oh, that's easy, right? So first of all, what in the world did our Lord wear? I mean, because he's an he's, infant. He's an infant, right? So, but you don't wear swaddling clothes at that point necessarily. Oh. And so, the, the does Our Lady for the first time? This is a mother, right? Very first time that she's going to present her child in the temple. And then, in her mind, how, how does she perceive? How that? do you? I mean, how, how, does, how does? It, she's how does? How does a the person norms. of perfection? Mm-hmm. But subject to the norms, consider how shall I dress my child? All right. So, all right, go ahead. How should how should I dress? How should I dress? And maybe they didn't have any options. Or you get into the whole issue. I'm of, pretty sure Joseph didn't think about what he was going to wear. The son of God, <laughs> the virgin I. mother, Joseph. They're subject to the the, 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 the legal norms of the yeah, law. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a good, that's a fun one. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. So if it were the descent of the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. and the distraction is... I forgot to respond to those emails, that email that I had to respond to. Oh, without getting into the topic of the email, just dealing with emails. Well, I think I would run with the fact that I have to respond. So I'm receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, in what way would I have to respond to that? Do I have an, I have an obligation to, to receive and to respond accordingly? Um, in what way would I have to forward that message? Mm. Uh, you know, to kind of go out with the apostles. Not just to get rid of it and get it off your plate. That's but. right. I, <laughs> <laughs> but half of emails is just, it really is just, it, bad, it's badminton. It is. And, yeah. and not, and, and then the other th- part of it might be if, if the distracting thought was, don't forget to go do my email, then I might take it in a different direction. In what way does the Holy Spirit help me re- remember things? Mm. Did the gift of the Holy Spirit, you know, and enable me to, or is, or am I actually putting on to the Holy Spirit that something that is meant to be managed on a natural level that isn't really dovetailed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit or that which I... Well, that's a good question. And your guardian angel and all that, because at some point we, when we remember these things, we, we might think about them as points of stress, but they mm-hmm. don't have to be. Right. I mean, if I'm actually in a, a mode of the spiritual life and, and, and living life of the Spirit, it's not something I can't ask him about and say... How should I do this? Mm-hmm. Should I do this? Mm-hmm. At what level does this take in my life? Um, and it doesn't be like a long, drawn-out process, but you're still engaging God in your day-to-day life. And so you, it doesn't become this laborious thing. So that was our before we go. We modeled wow. how to... I, I was totally forgot what we were even doing before we go at this point. <laughs> I just want to keep talking about this. I'm, so like, the... I'm going to go through all the mysteries now. <laughs> It's fun. It's a fun. You know what? You can do this in the car with your kids. You can do yeah, this in the car. It, you can. I mean, it's just uh, it's something that's great to do with prayer. So there was an old adage that when you get distracted, um, you, you don't pay attention to distractions of whatever kind, even even some possible, you know, sort of thoughts that are something you definitely don't want in your mind. Mm-hmm. Um, don't get wigged out. You don't pay attention to them in the same way you'd pay, pay attention to a rabid barking dog. The more you yell at it, the more you pay attention to it, the more it's going to keep barking. The more you stare at it. Right? 
Yeah. But if you take the content of it and draw that thing while leaving... It's like martial arts. Yeah. Judo. You take the energy it's that's just, coming yeah, at you and you turn it back or whatever into the is. direction that you want. Know, which, which one is which? Which one is the big guys? Well, they're... they're <laughs> that's sumo. That's sumo. <laughs> I'm not sure why I thought about that. So you're here looking with you, at with me. <laughs> I think exactly why you're thinking about it. You're such a jerk. <laughs> We better get going. <laughs> oh, all right. So that so everyone has their homework. Uh, they can, they, when they're praying the rosary, if distractions come their way, then they can, yeah. r- they can give this exercise a shot and see how it works for them. And like I say, also just kind of uh, playing game with the kids in the car. Yeah. Uh, to say, all right, if if you had a distraction coming your way and this was a rosary yep. mystery, it's a, it's a great way to have a conversation about the faith yeah. and to explore and to be curious. Because honestly, this type of, these types of conversations that we have, I mean, it's so much driven by intellectual curiosity, yes. spiritual curiosity, uh, search for the truth, trying to understand more. And, you know, this is the benefit of being such dunces as we are, because we're never going to arrive at a place where we're satisfied. There's so much we don't know that, uh, hey, you know, explore. It Enjoy is we explore. Exploring. So if we're d- way down here at the dunce level of understanding compared to St. Thomas Aquinas, think of how much more we have turf to cover than uh, than he does. So we're in, I've actually just spun it in a way that we're benefiting from, from our limits. <laughs> <laughs> you got to make your weaknesses work for you. Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. Very good. We'll talk to you all soon. God bless right. you. Ciao. Makes me wanna scream from the rooftop to the screen. Thanks for listening to this episode of From the Rooftop. For updates about new episodes, special guests, and exclusive deals for From the Rooftop listeners, sign up at rooftoppodcast.com. And remember, for more great ways to deepen your faith, check out all the spiritual resources available at tanbooks.com. And we'll see you again next time. From the Rooftop. Rooftop.